our recording. Okay, welcome everyone. Hi, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Destiny Dunbar and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for Resources. And today we're going to be hosting Jason Morgan, who is the Marine Project Manager for the Northwest Straits Foundation um, as part of our North Sound, Ste North Sound Stewards series. Um, and this is actually the first talk that we've had since June, since we hosted Victoria Sue's for Marine Mammal Stranding. So welcome back, everyone. Um, it's good to see you, even though I can't see your screens. Um, I know that you're there. Um, so we are going to um, go ahead and get started soon. This talk is being hosted by Resources and the Walk Marine Resource Committee as part of our North South Stewards Citizen Science Program. So this is one of our training opportunities. Um, if you're not a part of the North South Stewards programs and you're just here to watch and learn, that is also fine. Um, so Jason's gonna be giving a presentation on derelict fishing gear. So I'm gonna ask that everybody mute themselves and it looks like you all are already muted. Um, and feel free to keep your videos off during the presentation. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat and Jason may pause to take questions during the presentation or we can just save them all to the end. Um, and we will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna cut off my video here and go ahead and read Jason's bio. So Jason Morgan is the Marine Projects Manager for the Northwest Straits Foundation and is passionate about collaborative approaches to managing and promoting sustainable fisheries. As manager of the foundation's derelict fishing gear program, he works with state, federal, tribal, and recreational stakeholders to achieve the program's goal of eliminating harm from derelict fishing gear in the Puget Sound. The problem of lost and abandoned fishing gear in Puget Sound was identified as a priority by the Northwest Straits Marine Conservation Initiative in 1999. Derelict fishing gear in Puget Sound mostly consists of gill nets and shellfish pots, which continue to trap and kill marine organisms and degrade critical marine habitat. Through an aggressive campaign of removals, research, outreach, and education, the foundation has removed over 5,800 derelict nets 5,800 crab pots, and restoring 870 acres of marine habitat, saving thousands of marine organisms each year. Jason will discuss the problems, challenges, and solutions of dealing with derelict fishing gear in Puget Sound and what we can all do to help. All right, thank you, Jason. We can go ahead and get started. All right. uh, thank you, Destiny, and thank you to everybody who's signing on this evening. Um, quick There we go. Okay. Um, so quickly, I'd just like to talk a little bit about organ our organization. Um, we are a, a part of the Northwest Straits Initiative. And um, usually about this time, I would go into a little bit of a deep dive about the Northwest Straits Initiative. But since this uh, presentation is geared for um, North Sound stewards, um, I hope you got somewhat of an idea of the Northwest Straits Initiative is, um, since the Watkins MRC is such a big part of that. Um, and so the Northwest Straits Initiative, which uh, works to protect and restore marine resources of the Northwest Straits region, it has our seven uh, county-based marine resources committees, uh, including Whatcom. In the Northwest Straits region, we had the Northwest Straits Commission, um, which is kind of a governing body, but they also do a lot of other project support. And then the Northwest Straits Foundation, the organization that I work for, um, we, are, we are a nonprofit. We are originally um, form to, to leverage other fun, other financial funding that you know like the commission cannot do as a, as a government entity and so we continue to do that we support the work Northwest Straits Initiative and others um, but we've also grown a bit you know over the years and um, we also complete uh, regional projects as well um, through through programs a couple of our, our big programs we had the near shore restoration program and our derelict fishing gear program which is what we're going to talk about tonight um, so you can learn more about the initiative and more about the work we do at the website you see on the screen and also um, that's our, our social media handle. Um, so we're on all the social media pages these days so you can also follow what's happening with us on there. Um, so let's move on um, to derelict fishing gear. Um, first, when we talk about derelict fishing gear, um, we're talking about the fishery we're usually talking about is, uh, you know, there's all types of uh, some, I should maybe define the term derelict gear. Uh, so derelict gear is defined as lost, abandoned, or otherwise discarded. And you know, it happens in all forms, you know, whether you're rod and reel fishing, 
or if you have been have been net, big nets in fishing, you know, gear gets lost. It's, it's just uh, something that happens, and we want to try to mitigate that problem. Um, but generally, when we're talking about the large scale problem that we have here in the Puget Sound region, uh, we're talking about the salmon fishery and the Dungeness crab fishery. Um, so talking about derelict gear, you're talking mostly talking about gill nets and cursings. Um, and most of that, most of that derelict gear in the commercial net fishery comes from past fisheries, because as probably everybody on here knows, um, our salmon resources have depleted, which means uh, commercial salmon fishing opportunities have become fewer. So there's a lot less happening out there than there was um, in the 80s and moving into the 90s. Since then, everything has really gone down a bit. Um, so there's still nets that are lost, just nowhere near the rate that they once were. Um, and then on the Dungeness crab fishery, we're talking about um, lost and abandoned crab pots, both, re both recreationally and commercially. However, uh, this one on the other side of things for uh, crab, um, it's, uh, it's, it's more of a problem on the recreational side. We have it's about 70% recreational loss to 30% uh, commercial loss is what we generally see. Um, and obviously this gear continues to do, when it's, when it's lost, it's, this gear continues to do what it's designed to do was to capture, capture the fish, capture the crab that it was designed to catch, but also capture, capture other organisms that it's not designed to catch. And if this gear is lost in the water, um, there's nowhere there to harvest. Jason, to start fishers here, particularly times in this region. Oh, you, you cut out there for a minute. I think, here we go. We're good. Okay. Are we good now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so how we got to this problem uh, in the Puget Sound region is, uh, you know, we really kind of have uh, this wonderful region we have, unfortunately, has all the right elements uh, to make derelict fishing gear a problem. Uh, derelict fishing gear is a worldwide problem, but it's much different in different areas of the world, different fisheries, different habitats, different reasons for loss. Um, we, we, we have had uh, one of the worst localized derelict fishing gear problems in the world. Uh, what led to this problem was the extreme fishing effort we used to have on the salmon fishery side. We still have strong fishing effort in the Dungeness, Dungeness crab fishery. Um, we have a lot of rocky reef habitats, particularly when we get up into the San Juan Islands areas, up all the way up through Port Roberts in that area where a lot of the, a lot of the gillnet fisheries happens. You have these rocky reef habitats when gear moves, these nets can get hung up on these rocky reefs, um, and that's how they, get, they can often be lost. Uh, and we also have strong currents, we have extreme weather events, uh, we have a lot of vessel traffic, um, whether it's recreational boats, um, but then we have a lot of commercial traffic. So we have shipping lanes, we have cargo ships coming through, we have tugboats, uh, we have ferries, I'm sure everyone on here has you know, read or heard about, you know, we get our ferries shut down because of tangling crab pots. Um, so all these different um, issues are, are one of the common things that, that lead to pot loss, pot loss and net loss in our area. Um, so the way we, the way we deal with this um, in 2002 is when we really started addressing the problem and we've been doing it since then. So uh, first we, we do removals. So we get in the water and we remove the gear to, to, uh, to, elim to eliminate that immediate uh, threat and future threat that it has there. Um, we've also have done and continue to do a lot of research um, you know, when, when we discovered this issue, there's little known about this research here, really anywhere else in the world. A lot of places in the world have modeled um, what they do with derelict fishing gear off, the, off of what we've achieved here in the Northwest Straits Initiative. Um, so the research we've done is including better understanding what the impacts are, um, what species are getting trapped and killed, how many, how much, um, and also, you know, what, can, what kind of uh, modifications in gear and stuff like that can we do to better, um, to, to better alleviate uh, any gear that does get lost, or is there, is there things we can do to the gear to help prevent it from getting lost? And then, um, then the last approach we do is outreach, edu outreach and education. So, um, you know, educating people on the problem, why it's a problem, and what they can do and work with us to do to prevent it from happening. So when we're removing gear, um, the vast, vast majority of the gear that we've removed, um, we've identified with side scan sonar surveys. Um, so as you see on this diagram here, we have a little, we call it a tow fish. Um, it really looks like a little submarine that gets dragged behind a boat at a really slow speed. And we, depending on salinity, temperature, currents and stuff, we generally get about a 50 meter scan off of that. 
and, uh, and we can identify pots and nets uh, to go investigate. So on the right, right hand side, you can see here's a sport crab pot and a commercial crab pot. Kind of tell the difference by uh, one's square, the other one's circle and much longer, larger. We certainly have circle uh, recreational pots as well, but just given the size of that, we're, we're, we're pretty sure that's a commercial crab pot. On the left hand side of that, um, you see those ridges, those ridges are nets. So when we, when we identify um, potential net targets, what we do is we send out a small boat, not equipped to remove gear, but just to do quick dive downs and verify them. Because as you can see, those are kind of ridge lines there. So nets are a little harder to say, this is 100% a net from the side scan sonar surveys. So it costs a lot of money to get a removal team together. So to be cost effective, we do um, investigations first. Um, on the uh, pot side of thing, we're in the upper, we're in the mid to upper 90% um, uh, confirmation rate of, of having uh, our targets be positive and be crab pots. So we just send out a removal crew and get after it, uh, removing crab pots. Um, so the way we do this is we use, uh, once, once we find the gear, locate the gear, uh, we use divers. Um, so this is two, three years ago um, off the coast of Mukilteo. Um, and this is a diver that's getting ready to go and retrieve a crab pot. These are ideal conditions. It's obviously not always like that super clear water, which is why we're able to share this video. Um, and so the, 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 uh, the vessel operator is uh, using a GPS and dropping his, uh, dropping the, putting the vessel right over top of where we believe the pot is. The, he yells out to the back crew to drop, drop the weight, he drops the weight. And when everything works out perfectly, you can see that weight that lands right next to the crab pot. Done all, we don't always get it spot on like that. So sometimes you get to do a little bit of searching and the diver hangs onto that rope and walks the circumference around that um, dumbbell weight until he will snag the pot. Um, you know, sometimes we don't find it, but usually, usually we do find it. And that's a, that's a diver jerking on the rope to let the guy on board um, know that it's ready to go. And now that it's pulling up with the hydraulic lift. Um, now this is a, it's a different process when we're removing that. So with pots, it's a lot less dangerous, but it's going down uh, getting the pot and coming up. Um, so we're just using uh, scuba tanks, going down with scuba gear. And, but when we're doing it with nets, um, it's always surface supplied air. So there's a hose going from the boat um, down to the bottom with the diver. So that diver always has air pumping to him or her. So if it does get caught up in the net or something down there gets tangled up in the net, um, we're not fighting time. Uh, to get down there. We always have a backup diver on board that's ready to go down for safety measures as well. And the way a net gets removed is that we'll cut it up in sections and we'll have float bags down there that, that bring it up um, with the hydraulics. Once, uh, once we do get the gear on board, first off the, uh, the diver down there will look at anything that's entangled in the nets and pots and release it if he can and help communicate it to us so we can document that. Once it's on board, um, we, we release everything, whether it's dead or alive, back, back into the sound. Um, and we document everything that, we, that we've brought on board. The only thing we ever keep is maybe like stuff like bird bones and stuff. So if we need to, uh, to collect specimens so we can identify what it was that we caught. Um, so cleaning up the Salish Sea. So we have now removed more than 5,800 derelict nets. We've removed more than 5,900 pots. Um, doing all that has restored over 870 acres. and uh, you know, this gear, this gear is meant to be selective when it's trying to catch the, what it's trying to catch, but once it's lost, the gear is not selective anymore. So you can see there's going to be a big range of uh, marine organisms, marine animals that we find. So over to the right there, you see we have a lot of, a lot of dead seabirds. Uh, there's a river otter there, um, harbor seals on the back. Um, so anything that's living out there has potential to get tangled up in this gear. Um, and it's cost a lot of money. Uh, since over $11 million have been spent uh, cleaning up the sound, um, but it's been going on a long time. It's been a big haul and it's been going on since 2002. So it's been, it's been a long time that we've been working and spending that money down. So this is a map of uh, where all the net removal, a heat map of where all the net removals have taken place. Um, so you can see it's, uh, it's a future sound wine problem, but not so much in South Town where a lot less of the fishing happens. You can see up here where there's a lot of red around uh, San Juan, around South San Juan Islands, and then up there next to the border, Point Roberts. That's where a lot of the fishing happens, a lot of the rocky reefs are, and so thus, uh, that covered the most nets. So um, a total of 5,811 nets have been recovered. Um, we found entangled in those nets, um, we found 
84 marine mammals, over 1,000 birds, over 5,700 fish, and almost 479,000 invertebrates. Um, but what's important to think about, so when we pull up a net, it only gives us a small snapshot of what the impacts of that net are over time. Um, generally, nothing's gonna hang out in that net for like longer than two weeks. You have decomposition rates, you have scavengers that come and eat on what's hung up in the net, you have fallout rates when we're, when we're pulling it up. So we're really just getting a tiny snapshot of the ultimate damage that that net has while it's down there. Um, so back in 2010, some researchers at UC Davis, uh, they came up here, uh, did a research project, dived on nets, used our data, and they developed a catch rate model. Um, this is in a, a peer-reviewed uh, published journal. And, and with this catch rate model, what we can do is we can estimate what the long-term effects of this gear is underwater if we hadn't been pulling it up. And it takes into account fallout rates, decomposition rates, scavengers, and stuff like that. Um, so based on this, uh, this published catch rate model, uh, we can estimate that, so you see the second chart down here, that if we, if those 5,811 nets were in the water, they could potentially be catching over 2,200 mammals annually, over 29,000 birds annually, over 63,000 fish annually, over 11 million invertebrates annually. Um, so you can see how this is, is, is quite devastating of a problem. Um, the good news is, is that um, 2015, we, we completed what we call the, the legacy net removal, essentially removing all the old and fairly recent nets out of Puget Sound. And so now, you know, if you drain Puget Sound, would you find a net that we missed? Probably so, but we feel pretty good saying that we cleaned up the sound. And so now we estimate there's about 20 to 25 nets that are lost per year. So no nearly the impact. And I'll talk, I'll talk more in a moment about what we're doing for those those newly lost nets uh, that are making their way uh, back into the um, So something I did not mention when I talked about um, our diving is that we have a maximum diver depth of 105 feet. Um, once you go beyond 105 feet, the risk becomes a lot more and it becomes a lot more expensive, difficult of a project to do. You have to have a compression chamber on board um, the amount of time down there really, really changes once you start getting down to those deep, to those depths. Um, so we've been looking at, and there's not a lot of gear that we know of beyond 105 feet, um, but we, we have been trying to figure out how to get to them. So when we, so in 2014, I believe, we did a deep water pilot project to see if we could uh, go get these deep water nets with um, an ROV. At that time, we had uh, what's 204 deep water targets in Puget Sound that we wanted to investigate. Um, and so we first tested in shallow water to see if we could remove a net with the ROV, and then we went and did the work with the ROV. Um, so it was, it was successful in that we removed nets. Uh, we were able to, rem to remove 10 nets with the ROV, um, but the problem was it was super slow, really slow working um, with that ROV, um, really slow, methodical, and ultimately really expensive. Um, the cost of it it turned out to be about $30,000 a day, uh, which is, excuse me, <coughs> which is about six times higher than what a shallow water dive removal costs. So we scrapped that, <coughs> but something else we've been working on, our partners have been working on is now, the past few years, um, some army an army dive team has been coming out uh, that does deep water dives and they're looking for trainings in the area. So they come out here with, and they get a boat and everything and it's just a cost of project management to have their divers go down and remove some nets. So that's a cool new project that's happening. We, we've actually kind of stepped back from that project and let our partners handle that. So uh, Department of National Resources and Natural Resources Consultants is managing that project, but they're, they're, they're slowly whittling away at the few um, deep water net targets we have out there. And so I mentioned um, we still have nets going into the water, at, albeit at a much slower rate. So in 2012, we started the Reporting Response and Retrieval Program. Um, so what this is, this is a program that allows fisher, fisher agencies, first managers, sorry. Tickle in my throat. Um, in general public, anybody who sees what they believe may be a derelict net, um, to report this to us. So if you go to our website, uh, we have 
a reporting link on there. And then also you can call into, we have a hotline, our main number 360-733-1725. That's also a hotline to report derelict fishing gear. Um, I'm sorry, just nets. And so state fishers are required to report the gear within 24 hours. Um, tribal fishers are required to report on NOAA harvest rules and most tribal fisheries, they have their own reporting elements as well. And um, we're, we have been and we still are currently funded to, to respond to all reports that come in. Um, and we're able to go out and retrieve those nets at no cost and no fault to the fishermen. Um, so if we, get the, if we get the net reports, we can go out and get them um, before they really can become derelict and do harm. Uh, since this program started in June of 2012, uh, we've removed um, 86 nets. And something we've learned is that it's really important to get those nets out as quick as we can. Uh, because, so when we're removing the, the old nets, those nets are down on the bottom. So they move around in the water column so much, but they're really mostly settled on the bottom. Um, these newly lost nets are typically still working how they were designed, meaning they have floats on top, lead lines on the bottom, and so the nets extended through the water column. So those pelagic species, species that hang out in the water column, is still very dangerous to them. So for example, if you look on here, uh, marine mammals, um, in those 5,811 nets, uh, we caught 84 marine mammals. And just these newly lost nets, only 86, we caught 34. So the catch rate of stuff like marine mammals, birds, and fish, which live in the pelagic column, um, is much greater, it's a much higher rate. So we wanna get those nets out as quick And then conversely, on the other side, lost and they settle on the bottom. Now they're covering up uh, critical habitat, rockfish habitat. Now they're catching rockfish and Dungeons crab and other species on the bottom. And so, um, yeah, getting it, getting it out as quick as we can is going to help um, all around from top to bottom. <clears throat> um, so now, uh, Destiny, I'm going to grab another glass of water. And if maybe you want, if there's any questions on nets, I'll come back and add those real quick before we get into crabs. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. And folks, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat. If not, that's totally fine. We will also take questions at the end. <clears throat> All right, Jason, no questions yet, but I actually had a question. Um, okay about the retrieval program. I was wondering if you had data from before the retrieval program and after, and if you noticed a difference um, in the amount of nets and pots that you were catching. And I'm also curious if you know, um, what, is the, what is the penalty, if any, for leaving your nets behind? I imagine it's one of those things that maybe just can't be helped, but I'm wondering if there's any like, policies or like regulations around using nets in really um, rocky areas where it's like more prone to happen? Right. Um, so, uh, so, so let's start, start with the first part of the question. Um, so about whether or not we have understanding of like the rate of loss before and after the, the RRR program, as we call it, the Reporting Response Retrieval Program. Um, no, we don't because the reason being is, is once, we, once we identify the problem of barely gear, that, and started um, started working to address it in 2002. Um, the salmon fishery had already greatly reduced, and so already, um, you know, most of these nets we were getting were, you know, from as late as the 80s, um, you know, 80s, 90s. Um, so these are decades old nets. Um, and so when we launched the program in 2012, you know, the rate loss is probably probably pretty similar at that point to when we started working. Excuse me, in, in the derelict derelict fishing world. Um, sorry, remind me to say, oh, oh, the penalties. Um, I don't, I don't know the exact number and that's actually a problem with it. So we've, we, we haven't had for, for some, for whatever reason, uh, we haven't had great buy-in with the, with the fishing industry on, on complying and, uh, reporting lost nets. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's tough to understand the reason I, you know, I know the fishing community has really gotten beat up over the years, unfortunately. Um, so they're, to, you know, they can be hesitant to um, work with any type of regu regulatory authority. We're not a regulatory authority, but there is regulations associated with the program. Um, you know, and there's a lot of, a lot of public perception out there really hurts the fishing industry because they're, they're, it's easy to, they're visible. So it's easy to point your finger at somebody that's got a gill out of the water instead of, you know, your neighbor who might be washing a car next to a drain that goes right into Puget Sound. 
Um, so there, there's been some unfortunate hits on the fishing industry and has made it difficult for us. Um, so I, what I would like to see is a higher um, penalty. And I don't, I don't know the number of the penalty, but it's essentially, it's essentially more or less a traffic ticket. Um, it's, not a, it's not a severe penalty. Um, and then the other problem with that is, is there really needs to be um, a more effective way of um, marking your gear. So right now you're, they're required to have an ID tag on one buoy on the entire gill net. So say you have a gill net 100, 100, you know, 100 feet long, more, or something like that. You probably just got your tag, your ID tag, just on the end buoy. When they, if, they, if the gear gets hung up, they're trying to get that gear. So usually when we get a gear, you know, a section of it has been ripped off because um, they're trying to salvage what they can. And so it's, it's actually pretty rare that when we find gear um, uh, that, that it has a name tag on it, usually that name tag is gone. We've only been able to return, and that's the thing, people can report the gear to us and so we can get there and do our best to get out in the best condition, we can return it to them. We've, we've, returned, we've only returned two nets of the 86 newly lost nets that were removed. Um, and I think there's just been, I think it's just been two, <clears throat> two penalties um, that have been enforced so far, being able to identify who it was and, and giving, them, giving them a ticket for it. Okay, thank you for that. And that is all the questions that we have so far, so you can okay. move on. Cool. Um, so, derelict crab pots, it's a, uh, it's derelict fishing gear, but it's a totally different um, beast. Uh, and different solutions. Um, number one, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, is that this is, it is a commercial problem too, but it's much more a recreational problem than it is a commercial problem. Um, so there's an estimated 12,000 crab pots that are lost annually. Um, you know, and to be honest, that, that number, we're, that number, we're working on a study right now. That number is actually closer to 14,000 now, but this is the 12,000 numbers from peer reviewed published research that we did. Um, so West Bar was still saying that number while we're working on this, on this other research project. Um, but part of where we got that estimated from is a mortality study that we published in 2011. And we learned in that study that crab pots can continue to fish for up to 2.2 years. Um, that's what we found in our, other, our study, but um, you know, other studies that have happened in Alaska and other parts of the world have shown they can, they can uh, fish for much longer. Um, and it also showed that a loss of these crab pots each year um, causes the death of over nearly 179,000 harvestable crabs are lost every year from these derelict crab pots. Um, and the unfortunate but also encouraging part of this is that most of it is, is a user error. So that means um, this is a potentially solvable problem where we can greatly reduce the problem in different ways, um, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, so similar to the, uh, the nets, you know, it's a Puget Sound wide problem, but there's a lot less down um, in South Sound. We actually, we, we haven't done much work crab pot wise out in South Sound, but I haven't allowed in South Sound right now because their population is We removed a total of 5,963 pots. Um, in those pots, we found 4,280 crab, um, but just like the nets, you know, that's just a snapshot. Um, you know, when crab pots are lost, it's just, it's a self-feeding mechanism. So, you know, there's bait in there. Crabs go in there, eat the bait, so the bait's gone. But then as crabs start to get slow um, and lethargic, crabs will can cannibalize on other crabs. So it's a self-feeding mechanism. So once crabs get slow, lethargic, and or die, other crabs will come in there and start eating them. So a crab pot can continue and continue and continue to fish. So when we say a crab, crab pot can fish for up to 2.2 years, it's not because there's salmon and clams in there to some crab or put in there. It's because there's other stuff that's going in there um, and being scavenged by these little scavenger crabs that we have. Um, some of the common user errors we have are um, lightweight pots. Um, so it's highly recommended. You know, some pots you, you can buy, you can buy some nice big heavy pots, but most of the pots that we see recreational people use are lightweight pots, um, particularly these like square collapsible fold foldable pots. You know, for like 30 bucks, you can go to, uh, you can go to Walmart and get a whole buoy uh, line and pot set up. I think you're good to go. They sell them at Costco now too, but those pots aren't ready to go. Um, they're too lightweight. If you're gonna, you know, if you're in a super sheltered area watching your pot, then you're okay. But you know, most places, you know, a simple change in the tide, a little movement and current, 
will make that pot start to move. And when you go look for it, it's going to be gone. Um, another thing is length of line. So ensuring you have enough line to account for changes in depth and changes once those tides are happening, you're going to get currents. So you don't want to use 50 feet of line and 50 feet of water. You want to use about a third more of what the water water's depth is. Um, so you want to add, add another 15 feet or so to that. Um, another thing that we recommend is buoys. Um, so that small red and white buoy in the top in the right hand corner, that's what's required by regulations. But we, well, we recommend adding something else to it because everybody's buoy looks like that. And um, if any of you out there go crabbing, you know you can go out there and sometimes they're going to be a sea of those red and white buoys and it can be really difficult to find yours. Um, so we recommend adding something onto it, stick and flag, something else colorful like you see down in the bottom right. Um, another problem we have at times is floating line. So it is a regulation for your line to, to somehow sink off of the buoy. Because what happens is floating line can coil just underneath the surface of the water. And so vessels going by don't see it, get tangled up in it, gets caught up in the prop. Now it's a navigation hazard. But certainly they're going to be just cutting that so they can keep moving. They're not going to, you know, usually take the time to unwrap that for you, even if they were able to do that. Um, checking and knowing your tides and currents, um, knowing if there's going to be a strong change in tides resulting in strong changes in currents um, can really affect whether or not you're going to lose a pot. And crapping in high traffic areas, you know, it's amazing how many people will drop their pots um, right into um, right into vessel traffic lanes, specifically ferry lanes. Uh, but we really do feel that the, you know, from from the removals that we've done, and from the surveys that we've done with with users, we think that lightweight pots and length of line um, are the two most common uh, problems. Um, oh yeah, and also want to touch on, you know, just just the the size of the problem. You know, when you hear over twelve thousand crab pots lost, you're like Holy crap, that's a lot. Um, yeah, it, it absolutely is a lot. Um, but just to understand how we can get, get to such a big number is that, you know, typically every year, crabbing is really popular in Puget Sound. So crabbing endorsement and crab license in, Pug in Puget Sound, they sell over 200,000 every year, some, sometimes upwards of 250,000. Um, and so well, everybody can have two pots on the water. So that's a lot of gear going out there. And for whatever reason, you know, the Department of Fish and Wildlife hasn't given a good answer on this of why there seems to be a turnover, but every year um, about 30% of, or about 30% about or about 60,000 of those licenses are um, new crabbers. So people who haven't bought a crabbing license in Puget Sound before. So, we, you know, you gotta assume, um, you gotta assume they don't have much, they don't have much experience, if, if at all. Um, going out there. So we really need to educate these people on the proper practices so they don't lose their crab pots. Um, and so that's, so we do do removals. Um, obviously I mentioned removals that we've done, but we just do small remove, small-ish removal project, projects in smaller areas where we know we can target a high density of crab pots there. Um, it's just not feasible to go around Puget Sound and remove 12,000 crab pots a year. Um, so what we're doing for that, you know, we, we partner with our um, but our local marine resource committees are really the driving force for our really local outreach. Um, and so we've, we've developed different types of outreach materials that we hand out to users at Docs at Spoma Bay on the left-hand side, somebody from the COC Stewards Organization in Skagit County, so volunteer, um, handing out one of our rack cards that explains these tips and tricks that we have for you, and also handing them a crab gauge they can use for measuring their crab. Um, on the right-hand side, that's at a Costco um, over in Clallam County. Clallam County Marine Resources Committee, they put together kits of crab gauges, our rack cards, and fish and wildlife regulations, and they're able to go into the stores and attach them to the actual gear. So when people buy the gear, it's right there, and they have the information that they need. Um, so this is kind of like the, you know, more in-person, uh, gear-related stuff that we're doing to educate um, users and the way we like really get the big numbers of education is uh, four years ago now, I believe, we created a series of four short videos. This is one of them. Um, and each one of these videos is about a minute long. Um, and they each deal with one or two of the issues that cause crab pot loss. This one is obviously about uh, properly weighting your crab pot, um, what happens and how to do it. And so these are short instructional videos. There's no, the only sound is music, which I have turned off right now. Um, and it's just demonstrating um, how to do this. And we've, uh, we've mostly released these through Facebook ad campaigns um, every year. And we've also released it you know, through YouTube, partner organizations and stuff like that. Um, these, uh, these videos have been a big hit. Um, you know, we've had 
We've been reaching over 350,000 people um, every year with these videos. So we know that we're getting out to reach, we know we're reaching a lot of people, um, but part, part of these type of pro projects, these type of social marketing projects is being able to measure behavior change, um, knowing if, you know, if what we're doing is really amounting to less pots being lost in the water. So uh, we, one of the things we're doing right now is we have a, a three-year project going on in Dungeness and Port Town Bays, so over in Collin County and Jefferson County. And what we're doing is doing three consecutive years of removals in these bays. So these, these shaded areas that you see, these are the areas we surveyed in 2019, and each of those dots is a derelict crab pot target that we identified. Um, and so the idea is 2019 to clean out that area, 2020 to resurvey or remove it, 2021 to do it again. So we get we got a baseline last year, and now we're going to see what our pot loss rate is over year, and we're going to try to see if we we are reducing our hopefully not gaining pot loss rate in those areas. And while we're doing that, the Marine Resources Committee is there. They're really working hard at doing targeted uh, outreach campaign. They're testing out different methods of outreach, like workshops. Um, putting gear in stores, dockside, outreach, and stuff like that, and trying to see what's most effective. Um, and then we can kind of take the results of that and apply it to Puget Sound wide. So in 2019, we, were, we removed a total of 397 pots. So we got a baseline. This year, we removed 138. And so now we'll see what we remove next year, and hopefully we have a good reduction on it, because we've definitely been reached um, through different avenues. It's kind of like pressing as local communities um, as well. <clears throat> Um, another thing we're working on, this is a project I'm really excited about that I think, uh, I think it's really going to have a big uh, positive impact on what the impacts are of derelict crab pots. So in uh, 2015, we completed uh, the crab pot escapement study. And what this was, um, we're trying to identify, so each, each type of crab pot has a way for crab to escape once a pot is lost. And it's tied, and so for example, this one on the right-hand side, it's just a little door that comes up. And the way that door is attached um, before is with what's called a scape cord. So a scape cord is, uh, most often you see cotton, but it's gotta be a natural fiber string, whether cotton, jute, hemp's a really good one. Um, and that'll deteriorate in the marine environment over time, break, break off and stuff will open up. And uh, these escapement mechanisms open up and the crabs will come out. Um, what we learned over time is that uh, many of these designs are not effective through our removals because we're removing pots where these, uh, these crab pots were not supposed to be fishable anymore because the escape cord had deteriorated, but it was still loaded with crab. The crab weren't getting out. Um, and so we did a, we did a, a study um, at Noah Mukotillo lab and we tested all these different crab pots um, over a couple months period to see what the escapement rates were and what was effective and what was not effective. Um, one of, the good, one of the good things was, I mean, we knew this one right here with just a side panel that falls off. That would be easy for crab to get out. This one on the left-hand side, one of the most common ones seen in the recreational fishery. We did not think that it would be effective because where this crab is crawling out, there's usually a, a ring right there called an escape ring tied off with a escape cord. What an escape ring does is allow undersized and female crab to escape. And once it comes off, they just kind of got this little like cross opening to come out. Because it was up on the corner like that, like we didn't think that was gonna be very effective, but cool part was it ended up being 100% effective letting all crab escape. So that was good to see since so many of those pots are lost. Um, however, a lot of these style crab pots and actually a lot of these, uh, those Danielson crab pots, like the last one where I said had the corner um, escape ring coming off, they switched to this design, which is really ineffective, as low as, low as 15% of crab escape. Um, the problem with this design, if you look on this door, so first of all, these pots don't come with this bungee on here. That's a modification that we added um, after we saw how low the escaping rate was. This is once, even if this door is open, they have to crawl up the side of this, uh, of this panel and then crawl out over this lip to try to come up and get out of, get out of that crab pot. Um, so we first tried a meta modification of adding that bungee cord to at least open up that top and that got us up to about 60%, still nowhere near, you know, the 90 to 100% that we were, that we were um, looking for. Um, and so the last modification we made is we said, okay, well, the escape ring falling off of the other crab pot worked great. Um, side panel escape works great. 
and all pots are equipped with these escape rings. So what if instead of having these uh, escape, escape rings tack welded on here, what if they were attached with, with um, escape cord so they would just fall off right there? Um, and we were happy to say that we were able to make every single um, pot design tested, which essentially represents all the different pot designs in Puget Sound region, 100% effective um, crab to escape. So now we're doing with those results. Um, we're working with the state agency. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, so we're working with the state agency to um, to change the regulations where uh, crab pots are going to be required to have this. So we're um, you know it's a slow pro. You know we started this with the agency and uh, in February we had our first meeting and then we met with them and. Uh, Anyway, sorry, we, we, anyways, we met with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and then drove home and the next day is when the COVID pandemic started to hit the very next day. And so slowed down everything because we couldn't, couldn't do all of our meetings and the agencies went into furloughs. Um, so now um, we're starting to ramp this project back up. So over the next year, we're gonna be working hard with the, with the Fish and Wildlife Commission to get this put into regs at all pots um, required to have, we'll, we'll have that fall out. And so what does that mean? Um, well, another reg that we're working to have change as well is right now, um, right now the, uh, the diameter of the thread that's required to be used for a state cord is 120 count. And research shows that on average it takes 105 days for that escape cord to deteriorate, open up that escape and hatch. Um, so we're going to lose a lot of crab in that amount of time. Crab can live for months at, you know, months at a time. But when you're getting, you know, above the 60 day range, it's, it's starting to get pretty bad. Um, 60 thread count, um, we have an 80 day average and 40 thread count, which is what we want to push. Um, it's been tested in other regions of still being strong enough to be used in the marine environment, but have a 67 day average of, of deteriorating. Once you get below that, you're really not going to have something that's going to hold up to do the job that it needs to do. So you're still going to have some mortality, but we can greatly, greatly, greatly reduce it. Um, for example, this is this is how this is the study that we're doing is currently the numbers we currently have, and we're just focusing on the recreational fishery right now. We'll have a commercial fishery next once we can get this implemented. Because as I said, it's a um, 70 30, 70 percent recreational problem, 30 percent commercial. Problem. The recreational side of things, just from the crab pots that are lost from there, um, it's an estimated 135,000 harvestable crab are lost every year. Um, that's a it's an ex vessel value of 900,000. Uh, if you're un unfamiliar with that term, ex vessel value just means what the boat gets. So this is before, so it's what the boat is paid for at the dock. So it doesn't, that doesn't include the value of once it goes through processing, goes to the store, you buy it, you know, obviously the price of crab goes up, up, up from there. Um, but if we can reduce that thread count to, to 40, um, we believe we can reduce the number of crab loss to 78,500. So that's a 40% that's a reduction. Um, and reduce an ex vessel value to 525,000. And what's even more encouraging about that is that doesn't take into account um, the change in the design of the crab pots. We're still working on that. It's kind of a different, more difficult number to come up with of, um, you know, of what the overall loss of crab is just based on the pot designs. Um, but we know that will be a significant reduction as well. Um, so just this number alone is an encouraging number, but we know we can help a lot more crab as well um in the fishery just by uh, just by that that pot modification design as well um so those are the things we're working on now like i said we're you know we're still doing some small removal projects but we're trying to focus on um what kind of outreach works best and what how can we modify the gear and modify the regulations and modify how how people crab um so we can uh really put a big reduction in to this gear loss problem um so with that said and we can get some more questions now All right, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit them in the chat. Thank you, Jason. That was super interesting. I really like the level. Of, this is like a problem that I hadn't thought about. I actually didn't know that this was a problem until I spoke to you. I was like, oh, okay. And I really like the level of innovation and thinking that's going into solving it. So that's awesome. Um, I did have a question about the education and outreach because it seems like that is super important and I'm wondering if you know if there are if there's education required for new crabbers or if you're just able to get your crabbing license without any kind of anything 
No, and that's great thinking, Dustin. That's something I've been saying since I came on here as well. Um, that's another that's another push we push we want to have. Um, we don't have we don't have as there's definitely support at the state level, but not as much as we need yet to make that happen. So no, there is that that is the problem. There's zero education is needed. Um, you know, and to me it seems like to me it seems like a fairly simple thing to do. You know, I don't think you need to, you know. Once you, you know, just do it, just have to be a one-time thing. Once you've done it once, you know, just a short and sweet video you watch, answer some questions, um, and then you don't have to do it again. You know, you can get your license every year after that. I think it could be a short and sweet thing to do. So that's something I'd love to see implemented, and I think that would be a game changer if we can make it happen. And you had some cards that um, some volunteers would go and, like, attach to mm -hmm. gear. Are those cards on your website? Um, I'm not sure. Let me pull up the website real quick. Yeah. Cause I think that's a great idea. So if you go to our, I'll just show you going to navigate. So yeah, that's something else that, yes, I want to show you the resources that we have on here. So if you go to our website, can you see my uh, webpage there? Mm-hmm. Um, so if you scroll over to Dare Lake Gear, um, see there's a Catch More Cat Crab tab right there. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we call our out outreach campaign. Uh, so if you click on that, there's going to be a lot. I'm not sure if the rack card's there or not, but I can send that to you. And if, you know, if the North Sound Stewards wants to get involved in outreach and you want rack cards to pass out, put it to local shops or whatever, I I'm happy to supply as many as you need. Um, and so at this website, if you go here, this is, a, this is an online workshop we did with Department of Fish and Wildlife this year. All those videos that I mentioned, those instructional videos, those are on here. Um, if you scroll down more, here's those tips and tricks. All this information right here, that's all. So from here down, that's all gonna be on those rack cards that you can get. Um, like I said, I'm happy to um, supply you with as many of those as you need if, that, if that's, that is of interest. And also another thing down here where it says where, when and where to set your pot. So these are different links and apps to help you out. So like iPhone apps, ties near me to help you know what the tides are. Um, there's also commercial vessel tracking. So you can see your commercial vessels, vessels are, tug and uh, log tow route. So there's a lot of different apps and, um, and links on here that can help you out uh, as well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I actually just, um, resources just hold it, or hosted a beach cleanup last month, and a lot of what people were bringing in were just old nets. There were some, like, they couldn't even um, get because they were so tangled up at Simiamu. So I think that, that is oh, wow. relevant, and I think that our stewards would be all over that. Um, cool. Yeah, so I'll, I will be in touch with you about those cards. Excellent. Um, and it looks like we don't have any more questions. We have a bit more time left. Um, we can call it early. Last call for any questions y'all might have. Yeah, Eleanor says that she's hoping the MRC and North Sound Stewards can get more involved with this. I definitely agree. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, now Eleanor, I send it. It goes out to um, Austin, but I can CC you on it this next round, but always, you know, it's usually in May, because we're, we're looking to start, we start ramping up our outreach, um, you know, like in, you know, June, right before the, because the recreational season usually starts around 4th of July. Mm -hmm. um, so weeks before when people start to gear up, you know, is when we start uh, really ramping up, up our outreach efforts. So usually, usually in May, we send out an email to all the MRCs just to say, who's interested and if you're interested, how can we support you? Um, and so we'll, um, and so yeah, that'll come out to walk in MRC again uh, this coming. And I, you know, I can like ping this into to, to uh, sound worse stewards as well, but we'll, we'll certainly have information coming. Okay, perfect. Um, yep, MRC is great. All right, well, thank you so much, Jason. That was a really awesome presentation and thank you all for joining and watching today. Um, make sure you track your hours into Track it forward if you haven't been doing so already um, and keep track of that. Um, there's going to be a recording of this presentation available within the next couple days. So if you arrive late, no worries. You can watch the beginning of the presentation too. And I think, oh, and one more thing. We do have one more um, 
at least one more North Sound Steward Speaker Series um, presenter scheduled for November 9th at 5 p.m. And that's going to be Max Calloway presenting on Bull Kelp. So mark your calendars and I will have an email sent out to all of you to remind you. But with that, thank you all so much. And thank you again, Jason. Thank you. All right, you all have a wonderful evening.